We're going to talk about cartoons today, specifically Ed, Ed and Eddie and what it can teach us about character. But before I get into that, I want to start with renowned author Neil Gaiman and his advice on creating characters in writing. In his masterclass, which I've recently been watching, he suggests there are two main things to think about with a character. One, what's their funny hat? And two, what do they sound like? By funny hats, I don't actually literally mean you have a character wear a funny hat. What I do mean is you give your character something that makes that character different from every other character in the book. So maybe that's something different about their appearance, maybe it's their behaviour or the way they move or whatever else. Just something that sticks out enough that it makes them more distinguishable and more memorable. And the second thing, how do they sound? Dialogue is character. The way that somebody talks, what they say, how they say it is character. Dialogue is the majority of the way characters express themselves, so the way they sound and behave is what brings them to life and makes them feel real. The thing you'll notice is that he doesn't mention backstory as an important thing to think about when creating a character. In fact, he suggests backstory is something people get caught up in too much. People say, well, do you do, you do those sort of books and things before you start? Do you list off lots of things about your characters? And, and I say no. Mostly, what I do is try and figure out what they sound like. And he's right, because you might know every minute detail about how a certain character's childhood was and how they met their first love and all of that, but what does that matter if none of it is expressed through the character's behaviour? What does backstory matter if it doesn't make the character feel more alive? Let's take Hagrid in Harry Potter. Just from his appearance, just from his cheery, informal way of speaking, his distinct accent, his bumbling behaviour, the way he swells with pride when mentioning Dumbledore, the way he can run off on tangents when talking about animals, the way he can seem pretty casual and oblivious to danger around him. From all of that alone, he becomes a living, breathing entity, much more than if JK Rowling had thrown the history of Rubius Hagrid at us for several long pages of the book. So where does Ed, Ed and Eddie come into this? Well, it's because Ed, Ed and Eddie, apart from being one of my favourite cartoons as a kid, um, is a cartoon with basically only 12 characters plus Plank. None of them really have much of a backstory at all, and yet they all feel incredibly vivid, living, breathing people whose interactions manage to last 100 135 episodes, all set pretty much in a cul-de-sac, plus several specials and a movie, without any of it becoming stale. And cartoons particularly interest me in what they do with characters as well, because normally they can get away with so much more absurd, unbelievable stuff than live action, without it ever kind of breaking our suspension of disbelief. I mean, no one could believe Ed would really be that stupid, or any of them as mad as they are and do the mad things they do, and yet we still feel 100% invested. Partly that is because cartoons are expected to be a bit mad and absurd anyway, so it just fits into the comedy of the show, but it's also because the heart of each of the characters characters is strong and clear. They can get away with doing absurd stuff because the sort of absurd stuff they each do is in keeping and consistent with the sort of people they are. In that sense, their solid character is like an anchor, where all the madness is a kite, free to blow about in the wind because the anchor will stop it from floating away too far. That's why we believe it. That's why they can stretch the show to its limits without it sacrificing story and character and emotional expression. It's completely stupid that Ed would eat his mattress when told to do so. Good lord, man! <laughs> But we also accept it and believe it because being gullible, having an extreme appetite, being manipulated by Eddie and enjoying the weirdest of tastes is 100% Ed's personality. So what I'm going to do is just quickly touch on a few of the characters. I can't do all of them, nor can I do them in enough depth because it would take ages, absolutely ages. There's so much more to say about them than you'd expect, but let's start. Ed is a complete idiot in an incredibly innocent Lenny from Of Mice of Men sort of way. His emotional intelligence and resilience are lacking to the point he has no real regulation or grey areas between his feelings. It's just one of two extremes. Either everything is fun and funny and he's like an enthusiastic puppy, or he's incredibly scared and incredibly upset. And it can take surprisingly small things to cause him to flip between the two. For example, Eddie treats him pretty terribly throughout the show and the dynamic between the two reminds me a little bit of Ricky Gervais and Carl Pilkington. Eddie could boss Ed about out, insult him, god knows how much, even attack him and Ed won't be phased by any of it, he'll just laugh in his own dumb way, but 
give him a tooth ache and he'll completely lose it. Eddie exploits him non-stop because he's easy to manipulate and it's easy to find ways to make hard labour seem like a fun thing to him because of Ed's vivid imagination. He regularly loses himself in imagination rather than paying attention to the reality around him. He's fascinated by animals, chickens in particular, he loves food, scary monsters and aliens both fascinate and terrify him in equal parts, and his childish enthusiasm normally causes him to take everything they do to the absolute extreme. Any task he's given he will likely get carried away with and go over the top to the point it just causes chaos and ruins everything. He's got a complicated relationship with his sister who also exploits him with the threat of telling mum and dad on him if he doesn't do whatever she wants. He's terrified of Sarah telling mum and dad, and so whilst his childish enthusiasm, his general obliviousness to the reality, and the fact he doesn't know his own strength means he can cause chaos and upset Sarah quite often. Once he snaps back into the reality and realises how upset she is however, he'll become anxious to try and calm her. He's both scared of his sister while also trying to live up to the older protective brother role despite being too incompetent to ever really manage it. So how does he sound? Everything he says is said a little too loudly and with a little too much enthusiasm. He runs on long tangents, laughs and talks to himself pretty often and rarely asks any sensible questions that relate to the reality of the situation but more to the kind of game version of it inside his head. And his funny hat? Apart from the fact he's tall and wears a distinctive jacket, is this overly enthusiastic way of behaving, the stupidity, his terrible hygiene and the near superhuman strength that causes him to inadvertently damage everything he encounters. In his mind, Double D is very much the superior one of the group, not just the smart one, but the righteous one too. You get the sense he's half there because he feels someone needs to look after Ed like a parent, and that someone needs to stop Eddie from being too evil or mean or manipulative to others. Double D casts himself in the role of a parent who often lectures, speaks incredibly politely, and tries to be the moral compass. However, his arguments are almost always ignored by everyone else because he lacks any of the discipline or firmness needed to make his voice heard. And whilst he has his righteousness, there's also a sense he will still go along with all of Eddie's schemes and scams once he's been able to raise his objections. He does want jawbreakers himself, and I suspect part of him also wants the superior feeling he can get from saying, I told you so, whenever Eddie's schemes go wrong. And if they go right, Double D can absolve himself of all the guilt about the scams by blaming it on Eddie, and saying he was forced to tag along that he did object to begin with. Playing the righteous goody goody who tried but ultimately failed to stop someone else from doing the bad things and ended up having to tag along is a good way to excuse yourself of any guilt. Almost every character in the show show has a slightly different dynamic and way of speaking to every other character in the show, which I would have liked to drill down into, but it would take ages to go through the whole lot because they all have different opinions about each other and that's part of the depth that comes to it, but the interesting thing about Double D is that he's the exception to that rule because he talks to everyone the exact same way, which is this polite, often lecturing, morally superior sort of approach where he often casts himself as the mediator to try and sort out the conflicts between other people. Social interaction in Double D's mind isn't something fluid and disordered and chaotic, but it's something like a checklist with a set, correct way of speaking that applies to all situations and all people. This links to his very rigid, methodical, black and white approach to morality where there's always the correct thing and the polite thing to do, then there's the incorrect bad thing, and that's the end of it. Everything is seen as a structured science rather than an emotional, morally grey world. And we can probably link all that to the rare glimpses we get of what his parents are like, from the sticky notes they leave around his house. It suggests they're very strict, with very clear rules about the correct way to behave, whilst also being very emotionally distant at the same time. They leave notes rather than speak to him face to face, for example. And all of that fits with this kid who has grown up with very strict ideas about the right and wrong, alongside with a lack of emotional empathy. It's no surprise everybody always ignores him because he's too distant and disconnected to ever convey his ideas in the ways that understand. And so how does he sound? Polite? Considered? Morally one-dimensional? Often lecturing and always looking to resolve conflicts rather than cause them? And his funny hat is, well apart from literally his hat, his bright orange shirt and his thin frail size, um, there's his scientific intelligence, his neatness and his obsessive cleanliness. And so Eddie, I think I've only got time to do three, so we'll just do Eddie now. Eddie is incredibly manipulative and eager to scam everyone for cash and draw breakers. He rarely, if ever, sympathises or feels sorry for anyone at all, for which his scams can often stretch to the level of cruelty. He's incredibly impatient and often frustrated by Double D's slow, considered approach to everything. Whilst he often talks fairly quietly, he will also shout and bark a lot of orders at Ed and Double D, as well as happily insult and berate them. And the interesting thing about Eddie is that his 
motivation is rarely just to eat jawbreakers, but he's also very desperate to be popular, and seeing as jawbreakers are also kind of a symbol for social status in the cul-de-sac, it's unsurprising how driven and ruthless he is to earn them. Never to earn them through hard work though, only through scamming people, because hard work would mean Eddie is at the bottom of the hierarchy, where instead he wants to be popular and kind of looked up to as a king, hence his self-absorption with his own image, his love for flash things like fast cars and suits and that dumb glitter ball in his room. He has a strong rivalry with Kevin in particular, which is unsurprising when you consider that Kevin is the top of the hierarchy, the cool one in the cul-de-sac, the person Eddie wants to be. As such, he takes particular satisfaction in moments where he's able to trick Kevin or cause him harm in some sort of way, even if Kevin's revenge quickly makes him regret it. In general though, he finds pleasure in causing others harm, which may in some way be his own revenge for how they look on him as unpopular and pathetic and a dork. And if we wanted to, we could link all of this to the elusive, almost mythic older brother Eddie has, who was only ever seen at the end of the one-off movie, but was mentioned throughout the show as someone cooler even than Kevin, the pinnacle of popularity. Top of the tree was Eddie's older brother, and Eddie as the younger brother is then left yearning to live up to that same standard, yet also doomed to fail because his older brother bullied him and treated him like a run all of his life, which has somewhat scarred Eddie's status in the cul-de-sac as this bit of a run. He's desperate to have the same royalty state as his brother did, and perhaps even his maliciousness stems from the way his brother used to bully him. Eddie would like to be able to do that to someone else, only he rarely ever can because he's at the bottom of the tree and he's quite weak. All he's got is his manipulative side, and so it's through that that he exerts his cruelty on other people. And how does he sound? Malicious? Devilish with a mind focused always on scamming others, unsympathetic, often insulting, impatient with everything, and incredibly manipulative. And his funny hat? Apart from being short with a very rough, grating voice, is his obsession with anything a bit flash, that conscious attempt at being cool with which he often moves, and his general maliciousness. Obviously there's a lot more I could say and go deeper, and I probably should do, but I think you've kind of got the sense of these characters now. And you may have noticed that I have mentioned some sense of vague backstory in all three, that Ed's parents favour Sarah over him and probably spoil her and see her as this idealistic sweet girl where he's just a bad bit of a wreck brother, that Double D's parents are both strict and emotionally absent, and that Eddie's brother bullied him. Although that is backstory, none of that is stuff that we ever explicitly get told though, it's just mildly hinted at or that you can infer yourself from the character's behaviour. In that sense, all of it is told through the dialogue, through the ways the characters sound and behave. That's what brings them to life not the backstory. And to give you an example of consistently expressing character through dialogue, I've picked out a random episode, it literally doesn't matter which episode because they'll all show the exact same stuff, but I've picked episode 5 of season 2. And let's just go through the start of it, because it opens with Ed enthusiastically pretending to drive a car and deliver post while Eddie is getting on with the scam which in this case is a garage sale. And Double D is carefully considering all of his own items, calculating and deliberating the exact right price for everything, where Eddie is talking about his flash helmet. This cool helmet ought to bring it back. And Ed is still pretending to be a car, which Eddie now gets annoyed at and berates him for. We see Ed's own table for the sale is just a bunch of random items thrown haphazardly on top of one another, because as ever, he's gotten carried away in the fun of finding random items, and he then gets distracted by a bow he discovers. And Eddie then tells off Double D for selling his item so cheap, shouting in his face, What are you? Up the ante, Double D! Double D obviously then lectures Eddie on how garage sales aren't about making money but recycling items back into the community, but Eddie isn't listening, and all the while Ed's using the bow to fire random stuff about in the background. Amongst Eddie's items, it's then revealed he has his school photo for sale, which highlights his self-absorption and he stands posing all proud of himself next to it. And this is just 1 minute 50 seconds into the episode by the way, and yet we can already pull out everything we need to know about their character just from the way they go about setting up a garage sale. To summarise the rest of the episode with a few more points, Kevin is also doing a garage sale, which makes Eddie, who sees him as his rival, furious, where Double D tries to suggest that friendly competition is a good thing. At Kevin's sale, he seems to know exactly what everyone would want to buy, which makes Double D think he must have some spy network on the town, and they go to elaborate measures to then spy on him to uncover the truth, which is textbook Double D. Because there is no spy network, it's just Kevin knows what people would want because he talks to them a lot, he <laughs> knows them. However, Double D supposes he must have some undercover surveillance operation. And Double D has a lot of gadgets he's developed that still need testing. However, Eddie is impatient and excited by how cool Flash gadgets are, where Ed plays about with a coat hanger, calling himself 
the claw. From their own spying, they discover there's a party they haven't been invited to, naturally, um, but they think it's a spy meeting they've got to infiltrate, so Double D infiltrates it by going in disguise as Naz, which is very typical and methodical and carefully detailed of him. Eddie infiltrates by dressing in a blue tuxedo and trying to pass off that he was invited, which is typical Eddie, and Ed messes about with Double D's grappling hook to failing results. The point is, then, that the characters are consistent despite the absurd things they often do. If you have a clear picture of the ways characters will speak and think and behave in situations, then that itself will bring the character to life much more than any well-developed backstory ever will. Everything in that sense comes down to how they express themselves. As ever, thanks for watching. If I get this edited in time for daily uploads, it'll be an absolute miracle. Um, and if I don't, I'm sorry I've had to post it late, but like the video if you liked it, comment any thoughts you might have, subscribe if you want to, and hopefully see you next time.